Hey everyone, back again. Today we're going to continue on with David Ricardo's The Principles of Political Economy and Taxation. This should be part two of three. Uh, so yeah, let's uh, get into that in a sec. If you want to follow me anywhere other than here, you can find me on Instagram at theory underscore and underscore philosophy or on Twitter at David Guigno. If you're new here, welcome. I'm David. I try to explain philosophical texts and ideas in a way that makes them accessible to you. So if you haven't already, like, share, subscribe, tell your friends, who knows? They might get a kick out of it. Who knows? They might not. They might hate it. At the very least, I've been told my voice puts people to sleep, so if you have trouble sleeping, maybe put this on, and it might help you out. Uh, if you want to help me out, obviously like, share, subscribe, tell your friends, help me out monetarily via Patreon or PayPal if you'd like. Obviously no pressure. If you found this in podcast form, you'll be able to find me on YouTube, where I sometimes release videos, or if you found this on YouTube, you're going to be able to find it anywhere where you get podcasts where there shouldn't be any ads, but link in the description might help you out. At least that'll give you a link right to the uh, source. And uh, yeah, don't waste any more of your time with that stuff. So let's continue on with part two of three of the principles of political economy and taxation. We're in the last episode, which if you haven't listened to, you should go listen to it. In the last episode, we ended on chapter five on wages. Here we're picking up chapter six on profits. So all profits have a relationship to one another. That is, there isn't just a, an object or production that exists in one part of the world that is somehow detached from everything else because you attain profits by selling. And in order to sell, you have to engage within a market, which is going to imply some kind of relationships between the things being sold. So if you remember from the last episode, it is the least fertile land in the case of agriculture, in the case of producing raw produce, that is going to determine the value of an object. So it is then the case that the most or the least fertile land is going to determine profits because that's going to determine how much you can sell things for, which is also then going to determine the wages that people are going to earn because people are going to earn wages to be able to buy the things being made or being grown. So as the price of something goes up, it means that there's been more labor put into it or wages have gone up so that the capitalist needs to earn more money because they're paying more for wages, so they need to raise the price. So price and wages don't have that much of an effect on profit, really. So that it might even be that if there is a rise in price that is accompanied by a raise in wages, profits will go down. Now you might say, well, wouldn't profits stay the same? Because if you raise the price and of the objects being made and you raised the price of wages, how much you're paying in wages proportionally, that is, if you raise the cost of something up uh, $5 and you raise wages to match that, then you should be earning the same profits. Ricardo says that that might not even be the case because the difficulty in actually making the things by having to work on less fertile land might actually make it greater or make, make it even more difficult than anticipated in which case you're going to be spending more on, I don't know, machinery, on other things in order to make up for the added difficulty, which means you're going to be making less profits as prices go up, or as, yeah, which would mean then that wages go up as well. So profits will be affected by wages, but in a, a negative way, of course. So if there's a rise in wages, profits will go down, which means, of course, that prices will go up. So a rise in prices, while it might look like, oh, well, that capitalist or that, you know, the owner of the business is making more, they in fact might be making less as their prices have gone up. Now, he qualifies all this by saying that all of this only really applies to necessities, to things that are common, not to like luxury goods like diamond necklaces. If wages go up or if the price of diamond necklaces go up, then profits are going to go up because you don't need to pay your workers more to earn the thing that you're making because they'll never buy it anyways. They don't need to earn more to buy the diamond necklace that has gone up in price. If they're working on corn, if they're working on clothing, if they're working on um, houses or whatever, any of those things, the people, the workers themselves are going to also need and going to be buying if their price goes up then that means wages have to go up, which means that profits will either stay the same or go down. Now, what this means for Ricardo is that with the accumulation of capital, as more land is, is worked on, as more things are produced, 
in more difficult areas, you know, there is a growth of the society, but profits are actually going down with time or in relation to this, these developments. But while it might appear to go down in terms of numbers, there are so many other factors to consider that ultimately point to profits and everyone's livelihoods getting better. And this is really just setting the stage for what will become, you know, trickle down economics in the, in the 20th century. The idea that as there are more rich people, the people at the bottom will just magically live better lives because the wealth at the top will trickle down to the bottom, which I, I don't know what the current scene of economics is like in, in any way, but I don't think that that's an idea that any serious or reputable economist actually believes anymore uh, since, I guess, Taylor and Taylorism, or sorry, not Taylor, I'm, I'm thinking of John Maynard Keynes, uh, with the emphasis on social programs and the need for taxes, you know, to make sure that people don't starve and die and that things, you know, trickle down economics is by no means a reliable uh, system to keep people alive. But in any case, this is what Ricardo believed at the time. So with the accumulation of capital and with the progression of society in a capitalist sense, profits will appear to either stay the same or go down when in fact they're actually going up in real value because things are going to be made much easier, more people are going or fewer people are going to be employed and they're going to be able to make so much more. Technology improves, uh, all of these other things improve that allow people to make more money more easily. And that puts us here into chapter seven on foreign trade. And again, I want to reiterate, like I did in the last episode, that it might come off a little bit like I'm just reading a list here because the chapters start to get really, really short. And that is pretty much what I'm doing. So anticipate that. So chapter seven on foreign trade. Foreign trade essentially allows commodities to be bought more cheaply uh, than growing them or then producing them yourself. So for example, uh, some country might have really fertile land and they can make corn much cheaper or you can buy it from them much cheaper than it costs your own country to produce it. Now, Ricardo says that in that case, there should be absolutely free uh, trade occurring where that you, you know one country can buy the thing for cheap, whereas uh, making it themselves, it would cost so much more. And it, that is mutually beneficial for both countries because one country is able to feed their people for cheaper so they can have more money to spend on their own economy in other ways to make other things, for example, while the other country is happy because they're still earning their profit. And they maintain their competitive nature in the global market if they are trading with other countries and so on. So because profits are only going to be really determined by increase in wages or increase of prices that is relationship to that has a relationship to an increase of wages, where if wages go up, profits go down, where we, we have this kind of relationship, foreign trade will also have that effect. But like with manufactured goods, only foreign trade of necessities that actually bring down prices of things in the home market, only, uh, only that will bring down or will raise, I should say, will raise profits. Because if prices come down, then the capitalist can afford to pay the labor or less money, which means they're going to earn more profits. Now, this is only true of common necessities that foreign trade brings in, not like luxuries like diamonds, necklaces, or anything like that. Now, he really stresses that profits will only go up as wages go down or go down as wages go up, and that other things like, for example, in the home market, if there are new technologies introduced, or uh, you know, better roads introduced, whatever, that make transportation easier, make production easier, these won't affect profits because they will only have a relative effect on the entire economy, whereas profits in real value must demand some kind of extension beyond that economy to have more of a grasp over it through what you can buy with your uh, dollars that you've made. Now, just because profits might go down with the introduction of these new techniques, these new technologies, because prices will have uh, maybe gone up because they've, for whatever reason, like increased demand, whatever, 
Just because profits have gone down doesn't mean that society is not getting better, where profits aren't necessarily the sign of a better society because everyone's lives will have gotten better, more comfortable, because more things are being made now with these um, kind of new techniques, these new technologies. Now, of course, between different economies, there are going to be different issues related to actually assessing the value of things. So between two countries, like I live in Canada, and 100 Canadian dollars will only get you, I don't know, maybe like 70 or 60 British pounds, for example, or maybe 80 American dollars, 85 American dollars, whatever. Now, what that means is that a hundred Canadian dollars will get you the same thing in the United States or the same things as will 85 American dollars. Now, these two values are the exact same. Their real value is the exact same, but their nominal value is different. So this raises some issues and this is how money, that is the introduction of paper money or the use of like gold that is widely accepted among all these different countries as being a determiner of value, even though it's not universal it's not uh, unchanging, it's going to vary in value. We have these kinds of measurements to facilitate trade between different economies where different money values are going to get you different things. And there's always the risk though that there might be a kind of disparagement between uh, one country and another, and that's when you get possible exploitation occurring or whatever. And that puts us here into chapter eight on taxes. So he says that taxes are essentially paid for by capital and or revenue of a country. It can't be paid from anything else. So in Adam Smith's work, he lays out, he, he constructs, or he illustrates taxes as this great evil to all of production. And Ricardo shares many of those sense sentiments, but he doesn't have the same doom and gloom view of taxes as Smith does. Where Ricardo says that, yeah, taxes are ultimately bad in that they're going to hinder a country or a nation's economic development, their production, because every dollar that's spent on taxes that is spent to a government that is not being productive, it's not making things to be sold, is therefore money lost, money taken out of capital, money taken out of uh, being put into production, which is the only thing that raises the value of a country and what a country can offer. So while he has this kind of negative view of taxes, it's not nearly as bad as Smith because he says here he acknowledges that all taxes are really going to do is change the relative price of things. So if there's a $100 tax put on everybody, then that's just going to have the same effect on everyone else. And the natural price of things are all going to stay the same. You're still going to be able to buy the same amount. You're still going to have the same buying power because everything will have regulated itself once again. And here with the following chapters, he specifies how different taxes on different things, different commodities, different goods, ha have different effects. So that puts us into chapter nine, the taxes on raw produce. So taxes raise the price of raw produce, and so the tax itself falls on the consumer. So if a capitalist is taxed for whatever they're making, what they then do is raise the prices to make up for that tax, which means that at the end of the day, it is the consumer who's paying for that tax. But remember though, that with a higher price comes higher wages, which means comes lower profits. So it will also still be affecting the capitalist in that way. So both the consumer and the capitalist are losing out here, according to Ricardo, whereas the landlord is still earning the exact same. The landlord's not having to pay these same taxes and if they do have to, they can just defer them off to the capitalists. So it's in this way that the landlord is really a class of their own when dealing with taxes. And it is only, as he will come to show, a tax on rent that affects the landlord. A tax on anything else is just going to affect everybody else. And so that puts us into chapter 10, taxes on rent. So as opposed to a tax on income or capital like on a capitalist, which is eventually just going to go to the consumer with the elevated prices, a rent tax won't raise the prices for consumers because the landlord has no power over the difference between land, what is, uh, you know, a land is being made between that and the profits, which then some of it goes to rent. Because they have no control over that, 
they then can't do anything to affect the prices and the person uh, is not expect the capitalist is not expected to pay more now to make up for that lost rent because they're only ever paying the minimum amount or sorry the maximum amount they already could to the landlord they can't they can't pay more it's just simply the dynamic and that's something out of smith as well so a tax on rent seems to be the most viable one for ricardo because it only affects the landlords most directly and you might say, oh, well, this might have a detrimental effect because it will deter landlords from pursuing new land or buying new land because they're going to be taxed on the rent. But if you remember, the l most recently cultivated land that happens to be the most, the least fertile is not paying any rent. So it therefore won't be paying any taxes. But there are cases in which a landlord doesn't just own the land, but they might own like buildings on the land that the capitalist is using so in that case a rent on or a tax on rent might actually end up affecting the capitalist because then the landlord can turn around and say well screw you uh, i'm earning less now so i'm gonna you know make you pay more to me for using this equipment here or i'm not going to maintain it as well now because you know i'm not making as much money so he said he suggests that there should be a we should distinguish between land rent that is the money spent just to be on the land versus rent of stock that is owned by or a tax on stock that is owned by the landlord. And he just puts that out there. He doesn't really elaborate, but there should be this uh, distinction. And then he considers in chapter 11, tithes, tithes, however you want to pronounce it. So tithes are a tax on gross produce of the land and therefore fall on the consumer. And they're a tax on like everything that is made from the land. So Let's say a piece of land makes $1,000 worth of corn or produces $1,000 worth of corn. They pay a tithe that's like $100. What the capitalist is going to do is just raise their prices to make up for that tithe. So whereas a land tax wouldn't be applied to newly cultivated land because it there's no rent being paid, uh, tithes are applied to all land because it's not about how much you make in terms of profit. It's about how much you make, period. So not your net produce not not what you make in order to uh, earn profit but what you make period so he says that tithes are harmful because as you have to work worse land you're still going to have to pay this tithe but you're making less profit with these you know these new crappy lands and therefore it is going to be affecting the consumer even more so he doesn't like tithes because you know they're even you know, they're flat rate across the board, which is what we hear many people say that today. Many economists or wannabe economists say that we need a flat flat tax rate and they throw out some number like 20% flat tax rate uh, so to fix all the world's problems. But we see here in the form of tithes that are essentially a flat tax on gross produce. What that means then is that the people who are working the least fertile land are being disproportionately disproportionately affected than those working the most fertile land which is going to hinder development because people are going to then say screw it i'm not going to expand i'm not going to go work that land because it's going to be uh, i'm going to be in the red at the end of the day now that puts us into chapter 12 land tax now a land tax doesn't as i've already said in terms of rent it won't affect consumers as long as it isn't applied on all land because the first and both the first and the last cultivated, both the first most fertile and the last less fertile land. So a land tax can only be applied to rent, not to land, period. Like a, like a tithe is applied to all produce, period. So a land tax has to distinguish between land that is being worked on that is the most fertile, that is actually earning rent, whereas the ones that aren't paying rent or versus the ones that aren't paying rent. Then he moves into chapter 13 to consider the possibility of taxes on gold. So if a tax is applied that affects prices of corn, then the price will just be raised and the producers will lower supply to meet the lower demand. So if there's tax, you know, the capitalist wants to make up for that tax, so they raise their prices. Simple enough. But because corn is necessary, like everyone needs it, they will have an easier time doing this because people are still going to be buying it. It's not like some luxury good where people will say, well, you've raised the price. I don't actually need that thing, so I'm not going to get it. 
Whereas in the case of corn, everyone needs it. So therefore, they're still going to keep buying it. So the demand might not really change for corn if the price is raised because of a tax. Now, the same can't be said for something like gold. So if there is a tax on gold placed, people might not be so happy. And what might happen is that the supply might need to artificially be taken down so that its value can stay the same or in order to meet the lowered demand. Because if taxes are placed on gold and the price of it rises, people are going to want it less, which means then that people are uh, the producers of it or the person, people that mined it are going to reduce the rate at which they're mining it in order to now meet this lessened demand. And what this will mean then is that it will have more buying power, it will be more valuable, which, make it, which will mean it will be harder for people to actually acquire, which will only end up hurting workers, laborers, you know, regular folk at the end of the day. Now that puts us into chapter 14, taxes on houses. So like with gold, there's a, a difficulty presented when taxes are introduced. That is that it's difficult to kind of mess with the quantity without having pretty detrimental effects. So if taxes on houses go up and their prices then therefore go up, then people are going to be a little bit screwed because there's going to be too many houses because no one's going to want them. No one's going to want to buy them and it won't meet the demand. And so a tax on houses will be a tax essentially on working people because, you know, those are the ones trying to sell their houses. Now, he opposes a, a tax on houses to, again, the land tax, which would only affect the landlord, right? Because it comes out of rent, which is only paid to the landlord. But, you know, tax on houses will affect everyone with a house, which is, you know, everyone uh, at that time. Well, maybe not everyone, but I assume people working these farmlands had houses, which they would get taxed on, which they would have to then pay for. And that puts us here into chapter 15, taxes on profits. So a tax on profits raises prices, right? So if you're getting taxed on what you're making, you're going to raise the prices in order to offset that tax. Now, if the taxes are applied equally, then it will affect all commodities equally. So if all capitalists are taxed on their profits at the same rate, then just the price of everything is going to go up proportionately to one another, and everything will essentially stay the same. Even though he's still, Ricardo still doesn't like taxes, everything will stay relatively the same. But interestingly, he qualifies that this will only be the effect, you know, a kind of relative increase of everything where everything will stay the same. Only if that country imports or, or doesn't import, mines its own gold, what is used as currency or the thing from which currency comes from, because paper money has to be related to gold. Now, it is only or a country is only able to stay the same or relatively the same when it comes to a rise in prices because of um, a blanket tax on all profits if they mine their own gold. If they imported gold from somewhere else, then they're going to get screwed over because they're going to have less buying power now relative to all of these other countries that haven't applied this tax on profits. So they're going to get screwed over and it's going to be harder for them to actually get more gold into circulation to allow people to keep buying the same way with this elevated nominal price. So while it might seem like things are staying the same, there are these other factors to consider like whether or not they are mining their own gold or if they have to be buying gold from somewhere else or however they get the gold from somewhere else, which might then determine whether or not a tax on profits is actually going to do anything, if it's going to keep everything the same, or if it will have this negative effect of making them have less buying power. That is in the case where they import gold. All right, let's keep going here. Chapter 16, taxes on wages. So this would force wages to rise so workers would stay, essentially stay alive, right? Because if there's a tax on wages, the people will still need to earn more to buy the necessities that they need. So it's going to be the capitalist that's paying for this at the end of the day. So profits would go down because they have to pay their workers more to make up for that tax so that they, the workers can stay alive at the bare minimum, of course. This is all assuming that there is this bare minimum that people need. And essentially, Ricardo is trying to give this formula to keep people at the bare minimum, to keep workers at the absolute bare minimum 
in order for them to live their lives, which it seems horrible to me, but it's what that's what he gives us. Now he considers in chapter 17 taxes on other commodities than raw produce. So besides raw produce. So like with a necessity like corn, a tax on common goods would raise their prices and therefore raise their wages and therefore lower profits. So whereas other people like Adam Smith, like M. Say, like Buchanan, all thought that when a commodity is produced on rented land, its price will be as high as it can be in the market, and therefore any kind of tax uh, won't result in higher costs to make up for the uh, new tax, but will result in essentially a lower rent. Ricardo totally disagrees because remember, he says the value of something and its price is going to be determined by the land that pays no rent. So that's just an important thing to, to understand here and how he is differentiating himself from these other political economists. And then he goes on a bit of a tangent still in this chapter to consider the role of taxes in relation to war. So in war, taxes can be, or in times of war, taxes can be raised in order to pay for, you know, feeding soldiers who aren't being productive because they aren't producing anything. They aren't working at all. They aren't earning wages. They're just receiving. So he, he asks like, okay, how do we then make sense of this? Because this is a phenomenon that's going to occur quite often. That is, we know war is going to happen, so how should we gear taxes to handle it? And he's kind of vague about it, but he's like, ultimately, the taxes should be paid off as soon as humanly possible, or the, the loans or debts produced by war should be paid off almost immediately. You know, it's all about balancing that budget, getting everything back to normal so that there can be, the, the free market can run on its own accord. And then he moves on to chapter 18 to consider what are called poor rates. So poor rates is, an, is a general tax that falls on profits of stock and won't rise raise prices, or it therefore won't raise prices because it falls on the profits of stock. At least this is how the previous political economists characterized poor rates. So they believe that it will, because it falls on the profits of stock, it will then essentially be paid in the end by the landlord. So poor rates are proportioned to the cost of rent. Whereas for Ricardo, he actually thinks, well, it seems then that poor rates correlate to rent, but are actually determined by the annual value of land. So however much land, you know, the is, land is going to um, allow for, how much it will yield in terms of, let's say, raw produce, the farmer or the capitalist is going to factor that in. And they're going to say, oh, well, at the end of the year, I'm going to need to pay X amount for these poor rates. So I'm just going to add that to the price of my things being sold so that, you know, I can offset that tax. So then ultimately the price will fall. The tax, I should say, will fall on the consumer who has received this elevated price now. And that puts us here into chapter 19 on the sudden changes in the channels of trade. So manufacturing more so than farming is likely to be affected by external factors like change in taste, for example, war, tax on specific goods, whatever. And that is because agriculture always needs to happen. Food always needs to be grown. And so more emphasis is always going to be placed there, and it's not going to be susceptible to trends. And he's really talking about this when, you know, countries would just rely on like corn or potatoes or rice. Whereas today, obviously, things are a lot more complicated than that. So whereas in a time of war, a country might say, okay, maybe we don't need to be making linen right now. We need to be making armaments. They're not going to go to their farmers and say, maybe we don't make food anymore. Maybe you should be making armaments. They aren't going to do that because they still need to be making food at the end of the day because you got to feed not only the population, but you have to fe feed all of the military personnel, all of the army people, all of the, what, what are they called? The people, all of the military, essentially to make up for that, to keep them alive. So as a nation develops and it has more fixed capital in place, so it has acquired machines that really make production quite easy and you have all these manufacturing uh, establishment set up through industrialization, you know, you have factories put in place. As all of these things increase, all of these technologies increase, machines increase, fixed capital increases, 
then more of an effect will take place at a time of these sudden changes. So in a time of war, suddenly all of these machines might be useless for a short period because, you know, we don't need to be making linen. Like, let's say if a machine was responsible for making linen. And so they will be more greatly affected than other uh, other kinds of labor like farming that relies a little bit more on circulating capital because it comes down to a lot of human labor that are going to be paid day in and day out for their services. You know, you don't just pay them one bulk sum and then they, they do their job forever. You always have to be paying them wages that are going to fluctuate over time. So with the progression of society in terms of this capitalist accumulation of of capital, of wealth, then sudden changes are going to have more of an effect. And there will also be like just kind of natural changes in the whole process of the in, in the entire economy. So for example, in a time of war, the prices the price of corn might actually go up because the supply might have gone down because they have to be essentially feeding people for free, uh, feeding the military for free. And so they have to make up for that price by raising their prices, make up for that loss of profit by raising their prices on people in the home country, which means then that investors might say, oh, well, this is a good time to get into corn. Uh, Let me go and cultivate all this land over here and make corn because it's selling for such a high price. I'm going to go and sell it. And then when the war ends, they might say, oh, okay, now we're done with this corn thing. Or they might say, well, we're feeding everyone and we have all this surplus. So now we can trade more overseas or whatever. So these are all these possible effects of these changes. But ultimately, any kind of sudden change will gravitate back to a norm in a free market economy. Now he moves on to chapter 20, titled Value and Riches, Their Distinctive Properties, to consider the difference between value and wealth, essentially. So value, as we know, is determined by labor, how much labor power a thing required or that it can then purchase later on, whereas riches are going to be determined by profits, which are can fluctuate, right? You know, one year someone might be making a whole lot more money than a year another year, and so they will have made a whole lot more, even though perhaps the value of that money won't have changed. So let's say, for example, that 10 people made a thousand hats in a day. Let's say, I have no idea how many hats 10 people can make. Let's say 10 people make a thousand hats in a day. Now, those hats would have a value in proportion to those 10 people's labor. Now, if machinery, for example, was introduced that allowed some uh, some of those people to make 2,000 hats or let's say all of those people to now make 2,000 hats instead of 1,000 hats, they would be equal in value. So the 1,000 hats would be equal in value to the 2,000 hats, but they'd be able to actually earn potentially a whole lot more for the capitalist. So the capitalist might say, wow, I've doubled my produce. I've doubled what I'm making here from 1,000 to 2,000 hats. Uh, I'm not going to sell them at half price to make the same amount I might sell them now, I don't know, 75% cheaper or maybe more 65% cheaper in order then to still be competitive while still making more profit. Now, because the same value has been divided across more products now, across more hats, what that means then is that each hat has gone down in value and it has gone down in price as well. Now, whether or not these two things are proportionate is Actually, we can say that they're probably proportionate, but not like exactly. So they've gone down in value by half because the same value made twice the amount of hats, twice the number of hats, but their price didn't necessarily go down by half because the capitalist doesn't just want to keep making the same amount. They want to make a little bit more. So instead of going down to 50%, like I said, they might go down to 65%. So they're cheaper than they used to be, but they aren't so cheap as to make it so that the capitalist does not make any money. Now, a nation can become rich in two different ways beyond just, you know, a person becoming rich by raising their prices or whatever. Uh, 
a, a nation can become rich in two different ways. Either they reserve more money for productive production instead of production of frivolous things like, I don't know, uh, I don't know, diamond necklaces, things that not many people are going to buy. They instead focus on things that people need and that there will always be a demand for. Or they can, so that, that was the first option, or they make labor more productive and so it can make more things with same labor and with a lower value. So in the case of the hats, you can make more hats for less value. Now this approach, the second approach, doesn't stop the production of like diamond necklaces. It actually makes more of them because it uses more productive means to make the same things, but in a greater quantity. Now this is the metric for Ricardo of, uh, of the progress of society not things necessarily done more efficiently, but having more, more things, having more things circulating around, which can then be bought for cheaper, which then make people's lives just better. And this just feeds in more to the whole um, trickle down economy effect, but if you take it or leave it, then that's what he gives us. Now he further adds a distinction here between use value and exchange value or value in, in, in use versus value in exchange. So if new technology is introduced that allows smoother production so that, you know, more things can be produced with less labor or easier, more easier, uh, their value in the use will go up or in use will go up because there will be more of it to be used and sought after, whereas value in exchange will go down because new technology has saved on cost and labor. So all of those hats essentially have gone down in exchange value uh, because they are worth less in the market which means they've gone up most likely in use value. So the only way that th that would have happened in the first place is if there was more demand for the supply because the person, the capitalist, wouldn't have found this new way by introducing machinery to make double the hats unless it, he knew there was going to be a market or they knew there was going to be a market for them. So therefore, it implies then that there seems to be more emphasis on that product in terms of use and not just on exchange. And that I'll, I'll stop that there before moving into the final, the final episode, uh, finishing off there with chapter 20 before moving into chapter 21, the effects of accumulation on profits and interest. And so if you listen this far, uh, thanks. I'd love to hear what you have to say. If you want to like, share, comment, you know, you can tell me what you think. If you're listening to this in podcast form, pretty much, uh, or well, I think just on iTunes, maybe Spotify, you can leave five stars, leave a review. I'd love to hear from you. And uh, yeah, if I got anything wrong, let me know and I'll catch you next time. Take care.